passes the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
I don't want to visit my house. 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 I don't want
another beau had her clitoris removed and has never been able to experience orgasm. Their parents allowed this because they trusted their doctors and the damage it did to their families was enormous. I could not stand by while this practice continues, including at hospitals here in California. So what are we talking about? Intersex is an umbrella term that refers to people born with one or more of a range of variations in sex characteristics that fall outside traditional conceptions of male and female bodies. For example, intersex people may have variations in their chromosomes, genitals, or their internal sex organs like ovaries or testes. The majority of these children are healthy and or do not require surgical interventions. Intersex people make up as much as 1 to 2 percent of the population. While intersex people have been advocating for over a quarter century to be allowed to make their own decisions about their bodies, surgeons in California continue to perform unnecessary and harmful normalizing surgeries on intersex babies, forever removing their choices. Interact, the mission of which is to advocate for intersex young people, quickly became widely recognized as the go-to organization in the country and the world for legal issues impacting this community. Interact regularly partners with the largest patient support group in the U.S. We take guidance from parents as well as the youth in our first-of-its-kind intersex youth empowerment and advocacy group. Issues facing intersex people transcend the boundaries of any one identity or community. Intersex children are born to all different kinds of families. And I have collaborated with children's rights advocates, LGBT rights advocates, disability rights advocates, and others. Part of this collaboration has led to investigations by a number of major human rights organizations, each concluding that this practice is a violation of intersex children's human rights. This includes the United Nations, the World Health Organization, Physicians for Human Rights, Human Rights Watch, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Amnesty International, and others. Oh, and three former United States Surgeons General have authored a paper calling for an end to unnecessary normalizing surgeries, as has the American Medical Association Board of Trustees. This has been drawn to the attention of the perpetrators in California, including in a report by the San Francisco Human Rights Commission published over 10 years ago that called for an end to these surgeries. Yet even today, even in San Francisco, UCSF's website advertises, and I quote, in some cases, surgery can be done at any age. In other situations, surgery may be postponed until the child is old enough to express his or her wishes and to ensure healthy gender assignment. Surgery may include reconstruction of the external genitalia or removal of abnormal sex organs or sex organs that do not match the sex of rearing. In other words, the site is saying that it's perfectly okay to do a sex assignment surgery on an infant <laughs> without knowing what that infant's gender, eventual gender identity is going to be and without knowing what the consequences will be for that child. One of the most prolific surgeons operating on intersex children at UCSF, Dr. Lawrence Baskin, recently told a reporter from Harper's that he would recommend early genital surgery for 95% of intersex conditions. He makes these recommendations routinely despite the medical consensus that the vast majority of cases do not require early surgery and could wait until the child is old enough to participate in the decision. I have spoken at the leading medical and law schools across the country, and I teach at one of them, and my years in this community have shown me that more must be done to protect vulnerable children. This is why Interact has partn partnered with Senator Wiener's office to create a resolution that raises up the voices of this population. The resolution affirms the legislature's commitment to valuing the lives of intersex young people, draws attention to the outcry concerning this practice, and asks stakeholders in healthcare to act decisively to improve care across the state. I love California because it is a place that welcomes all sorts of people and takes bold action to protect our most vulnerable, including children. I know our legislature can do the right thing, which is to voice strong support of intersex young people and a desire to keep them safe to ensure that damaging, medically unnecessary surgeries performed without their consent need not be a part of their lives. Next, we'll hear from a practicing physician about the medical side of this issue. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Suji Tamar Mattis. Um, I'm an intersex person, and I'm a family physician here in California. Uh, I've been here in California for over 35 years, and I was one of the earliest members of ISNA, the Intersex Society of North America, over 20 years ago when it started. And it started right here in California, in San Francisco. That was the beginning of the entire intersex movement for the entire world started here in California. So this situation has to stop, and it has to stop now. California should be protecting the most vulnerable among us, the children. And it should be protecting our pa the parents of these children and not contributing to harm. What is happening to these children is both a violation of medical ethics and a violation of their human rights. We asked the legislature to send a strong statement that this cannot happen in California anymore. And what I'm talking about is not the rare case in which surgery is necessary for the health of the child. What I'm talking about is very unnecessary cosmetic procedures like clitoral reductions and unnecessary removal of healthy gonads which is basically sterilization, this being happened to children without their consent. So my practice in California, I see a lot of different people in a lot of different states of health. But one thing I don't tell anyone, I don't tell anyone that they need treatment when they're healthy. And that is exactly what is happening to intersex children, intersex babies in our hospitals right now. <laughs> The parents are misled by doctors to believe that this is the only option and that these surgeries are the most important thing for the health of their children, when in fact these surgeries create a lifetime of harm. Physicians say they need to perform these surgeries because children will, because children will be bullied or because there are negative psychological outcomes associated with having different genitals, but there's no credible evidence to support either of these assertions. Just like there's no credible evidence to support any claims that surgery is necessary in infancy. I want to repeat that. There are no credible reports that surgery is important in infancy or that surgery has a good outcome in infancy. After more than 25 years of patient advocacy, no one has been able to come up with any research showing that unnecessary normalizing surgeries have any benefit for intersex children. There is, however, extensive evidence of harm that can come from these sex assignments, post-traumatic um, uh, post uh, uh, issues from the surgical um, treatments and from the, the ongoing exams that these children go through, loss of sexual function, loss of sensation, incorrect surgical sex assignment. And, you know, there's recently in the past couple of years been a lot of new information about the serious risks of anesthesia when used on infants. But when what actually creates healthy children is psychological, su psychological support for their difference and not attempts to erase them or erase this normal part of humanity from society. I have to admit, I'm really ashamed. I'm very ashamed of my fellow physicians who continue these harmful and unethical practices. It is time, it's time that these stop. It's time they stop now. I want to actually quote Hippocrates, and we all know the part of Hippocrates saying, you know, first do no harm. Hippocrates actually said another really important thing that we shall be thinking about. He said, whenever a doctor cannot do good, he must be kept from doing harm. This is an issue that we doctors have known about for a long time. So after seeing decades of abuse faced by this community, I decided to partner, partner with Human Rights Watch to create the first ever in-depth report on the issue in the United States. We did interviews with parents, we did interviews with intersex people, we did interviews with uh, the doctors and other support staff who do these surgeries. We have the 200-page report in the back of the room. We explore the history of this issue, the research around it, and the experience of intersex people and their families, including parents and intersex people right here in California. That report is available, available on the Interact and HRW website. And <clears throat> I'd like to show a brief video right now 
that I think is helpful in understanding what parents intersex people are facing and perhaps useful as you and your members in, the, in your offices consider this issue. Thank you. she got to see you know the best specialists and the best providers who could you know give us the answers and it was disheartening we left feeling like we were on an island you know with with very little support and while we were confident enough to not proceed with the surgery I would be lying if I said we didn't have a lot of doubt about oh my gosh like they told us all these awful things are we doing the wrong thing by our kid Parents talked about feeling bombarded with scary and confusing information. For instance, doctors told parents that if they chose not to have surgery on their kid, their kid would be bullied at school. However, a claim like that has never been substantiated in medical literature. It's common that the discussion will be about how successful those surgeries can be, how safe those surgeries can be, and how well they can work in helping the child fit in. Uh, what they don't include still, for the most part, are discussions of the potential harms. These surgeries carry the risk of scarring and nerve damage, infertility, incontinence, loss of sexual sensation and function, and the need to be on lifelong hormone replacement therapy. I found out I was Freshman year, I retrieved my medical record, and I learned not only was I intersex, but then I learned everything they did to me to try to take the intersex parts of me away. It was like getting the wind knocked out of me. When I was first born, doctors found fungus on the testes in my abdomen and removed them. When I was four years old, the surgeons decided to reduce the size of my clitoris. I had no knowledge of this. When I was 11, they said they were doing surgery on my bladder. And when I found out from the medical records, it's that it was actually a non-consensual vaginoplasty. When these irreversible surgeries are conducted on children, they can have a lifelong physical impact as well as psychological trauma. When intersex kids grow up, they may want some of these operations, but that should be their decision to make. Physicians are very powerful in this equation. The medical saying, do no harm, plays a prominent role in care for intersex individuals. We need to really think about the fact that there is a significant risk for harm. There are two very rare instances when surgery is required on a newborn in awareness of sex development. One is when the internal organs are on the outside of the body as if they were turned inside out. The other one would be to ensure that there's a place for urine to leave the body. Any other surgical procedure on the external genitalia of a newborn is cosmetic surgery and is not medically necessary. Doctors across the US continue to conduct medically unnecessary irreversible surgeries on intersex children when the kids are far too young to consent and when the operations could be safely deferred until the kids are old enough to decide for themselves. These surgeries need to stop. I think our daughter is the best, 
the best evidence for why surgery shouldn't have been first. And she's she's awesome. Right after she was born, I um I got to spend a little time with her before she went to the incubator. And I remember I kept saying to her, like, I hope you're all right. I hope you're all right. And everybody was telling us all the things that were wrong with her. And that was so hard to hear as a parent. But <laughs> here in these last two and a half years, she's been doing nothing but proving to us that she's all right. I wish our parents would have known that. I would grow up and not want to have had this happen. I wish they would have known that when the doctor came to them saying, your kid basically won't be lovable unless you change your vagina, change this, change that, get your clitoris out, et cetera, et cetera, they, that they would have let that bounce off and know, no, like, if my daughter's not sick, then you're not going to try to change her so that she could be loved. She should be loved from who she is. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Michael. I'm legislative manager for Equality California. Um, Equality California brings the voices of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people and allies to institutions of power in California. That's what we're all about. Um, and I am here to tell you that this issue impacts a huge swath of people across California, some who identify as LGBTQ and some who do not, because any parent can have an intersex child. Um, as that video demonstrates, any parent can have an intersex child and end up in this situation where they have to make these decisions. Um, as an organization that is dedicated to advancing equality for people who experience oppression based on sex and gender norms, we are very proud to stand behind the resolution that Senator Weiner is advancing and to ask you all for your support. Um, as other people have explained so far, um, Anne and Suji, uh, Intersex individuals are forced to undergo medically unnecessary surgeries in infancy, well before they have any ability to consent or engage in that process in any way. This really stems from fear of their bodies because they are outside the typical ideas of female and male. Similarly, transgender individuals are often denied desired medical treatment in adolescence and beyond because of fears of their bodies as being atypical. Transgender people may be unable to access gender congruent documentation, identity documents that reflect who they are without undergoing surgeries that are in some cases unwanted. That's no longer the case in California, uh, which is great, but in other states there are still a tremendous number of barriers to accessing those documents, some of which are related to surgery. So both of these communities grapple with a loss of decision-making authority over their own bodies, our own bodies. Um, a person who is transgender has a gender that is different from what's traditionally associated with the sex that they were assigned at birth, while a person who is intersex was born with variation in their sexual or reproductive anatomy so that their body does not fit typical definitions of female or male. The LGBTQ community and the intersex community have overlap, although they are not the same. There's some interrelation and there's uniting based on principles of consent and autonomy. We believe that these principles should be valued not just in these communities, but by people across California, including physicians who really are here to provide care for all communities, including intersex and LGBTQ communities. So that's why I'm here on behalf of Equality California to support this resolution and to hopefully get some additional information out there about the intersex community and about what this really means for children, infants, young people and their families. Um, and happy to help with answering any questions that come up and, uh, and just have a discussion with you all for the rest of the time that we have. Thank you so much. Why don't we uh, applaud for all our presenters. So we can take some questions now. Um, for all of us, please just repeat the question into the microphone because uh, there are some folks watching on the video. And we'll probably do a little musical chairs to, to get to it. But um, yeah, happy to take your questions at this point in time. Please. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Greg Kramer with uh, Senator Bell's office. I thought it was pretty interesting how um, the only medically necessary surgery that they, that they spoke about was if female genitalia was on the outside of the 
So you're asking about the specifics of what kind of surgery might be medical ne medically necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So the only medically necessary surgery is if the bladder is born, if the child's born with the bladder actually on the outside of the body, does not work so good that way, and that needs that is actually does need to be medically repaired. And the other situation is if there's nowhere for urine to leave the body, that is also a, a, an issue that requires surgery. Otherwise, everything else is cosmetic. So the question is if there's a cost difference between surgery done early and surgery done late that might play into how families are counseled. I'll give that to the doctor too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so surgeries that are done, well, let's just look at the surgeries that are done later in life. And when you're doing a surgery, a genital surgery, a cosmetic genital surgery later in life, you actually have a lot more tissue to, to work with. You're actually able to visualize the nerves and you can get a very good cosmetic result. Um, when you do these surgeries earlier in life, you can't really visualize things so well. You don't get as good of a cosmetic or functional result. Plus, when you do the surgeries early, you are, once you bought that first surgery, you're actually going to buy more surgeries because very often there will be revisions, scar tissue forms that needs to be dealt with, um, especially in the case of hypospadias, where you, you are, it, there's very few of these surgeries that are one and done, as they're called. You are going to have to like fix things along the way. So from an actual cost standpoint, I believe it's a lot more expensive to do them early, but I'm not sure about policy as far as... Well, I'll just add that these, these surgeries, these unnecessary surgeries, are still being paid for by Medi-Cal, and so a very large percentage of the surgeries in this state are funded by Medi-Cal. There are very few people who get to adulthood and escape these surgeries, intersex people, and of those, there are very few who want them. Um, but I have never heard of a case of an intersex adult who wanted surgery and was not able to get it covered. Yeah, I, I will say I've, I've had uh, at least one patient who as an adult wanted surgery and was able to get it covered with no problems and was extremely happy with the outcome. So the question is whether there's any time constraints around when a person could receive surgery, presumably if they wanted it. So if somebody, well, I think what you're asking is, as the child's developing, are there stages where you need to do interventions, right? So the only real intervention you need to do is if um, the child is hitting puberty and is not sure what gender they want to be at that point. And most kids, most intersex people do have a gender identity, a very normative gender identity, may not always be the one that was chosen to, for them at birth and, and what surgery they, and the surgery they got, but the majority of intersex people will have a, a, a pretty solid gender identity by the time they hit puberty, and then you just proceed, you know, as you would with um, hormones or hormone blocking if there's an issue and, and kids still need some chance to think this over. Um, but as far as the, the surgical intervention, um, and you can really avoid surgery for as long as people want to. I mean, you don't need surgery in most of these cases. And, you know, there's no actual, you know, there's no timeline that is imperative to actually do any surgery. I'll also just add that um, national and international standards of care recognize that these procedures can be safely delayed. The question is, next steps for California. Either of you want to jump in on that? I'll take it first. Uh, 
So the idea of this resolution is really to get more information out to to people, including in the legislature, about uh, really the intersex community and about these uh, issues in terms of what healthcare practice looks like currently. With, you know, I, I think the idea being that once there is more information available, there will be additional policy steps that can be taken to really intervene here, frankly, and, and make sure that there is a sense of reasonable application of what the medical standards should be, considering like a, a true whole understanding of what it means to be intersex. Um, and, you know, this is one of the times where I think it makes a lot of sense for public policymakers to engage with this and really get involved in addressing an issue that has been going on for far too long in the wrong direction. So I, I think there are a number of ways that policy could improve how intersex young people are, are treated from, you know, from their birth um, and how their families are treated uh, and the information that's provided to them or not provided to them. So I, I think there are a lot of options for, for how this could move forward. And um, Equality California as an organization wants to, you know, be an ally role on this and, and help um, advance what makes sense for the intersex community moving forward here in California. So, Miles, I don't know if you have yeah, more to add. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, you know, one tangible step uh, you can take now is hopefully by this afternoon I will finish drafting the uh, co-author request for this resolution. Um, You know, the more allies we can get on board, I think the better we are, you know, full disclosure, I think we are looking at, um, you know, working on this this year and potentially taking stronger policy measures down the line. Um, So the more familiar people can be now, uh, the better. I'll also just, um, I hope this isn't too much of a digression, but I think the main thing I would anticipate your bosses kind of coming back with is, and and this is just what I've heard from, you know, people on the bus or or my own parents or, you know, other people I've kind of bounced it off of is, you know, shouldn't parents have ultimately have the choice to make this decision, right? Aren't we sort of taking away the rights of parents here? And I think what you can respond with is, you know, we, we don't allow parents to sterilize their children, right? We don't allow parents to give their infant a rhinoplasty just because they think their nose looks weird and they don't want them to be bullied. You know, while we give parents a lot of leeway, as we should, there are just some medical decisions that it's not appropriate for parents to make for infant children and that really the individual has to make for themselves. So I think if, if that comes up with your bosses, um, that, that would be the kind of elevator pitch response um, if it's helped. Um, and I would, I would just add to that that um, what our research has turned up is that this isn't parents making their own choices. These are parents that are being misled and bullied. Um, into making very harmful decisions for their children, and they regret it deeply, and it tears families apart when they come to understand what's happened. Um, so it, it isn't so much, I mean, you're right, we don't let parents do anything they want with their children, but this isn't, a, for the most part, a matter of parents who want to harm their children being prevented from doing so. It's parents who want to protect their children being misled. Um, and uh, I, I would just add that the ultimate goal of the intersex rights movement is for all intersex people to be allowed to make their own decisions about their bodies, which is just the state of things in California for all other people about medical care. They just want the same rights that everybody else has. Yeah, I think, actually, I just want to add, I think, you know, the most important here, the point here is bodily integrity, and that's all we're asking for. Well, a very brave and well-educated parent can stand up to doctors and prevent this from happening, and we know many who have, like the ones that were in the video, Um, but it relies on the parents having information that most parents don't have um, at the moment when they have had a child born with a birth difference, which is a very vulnerable time for a parent. Um, So we can't just leave it on parents to advocate for themselves in this vulnerable situation. Most parents are completely unprepared for this when it happens. Um, And this is why I think it's really important to get the legislature involved, is that, um, you know, the ideal, the goal is for intersex people to make their own decisions about their own bodies, and the ideal situation would be for doctors to be facilitating that. And there are many doctors now who do believe in and facilitate that kind of supportive practice. But there are still doctors who are doing these procedures and who are misleading parents. And when 
when that happens, that's when it's an appropriate time for the legislature to step in. We've had 25 years of controversy. We've had no evidence supporting this practice, and yet this harmful practice continues to happen. So we have children that have grown up now since we knew that this was a harmful practice, and we still haven't managed to stop it. And so, you know, this is really, it is a time for the legislature to take action. Yeah, I have to say, um, that is the hardest thing for me, is going to, <clears throat> so I go to the, uh, the support group meeting every year of parents and of intersex kids, uh, people with intersex conditions and their families. And the hardest thing is talking to people who are 18, 19, 20, and saying, you know, I, I really tried, I really tried to not have this happen to you. I did everything I could and I haven't been able to make it stop. And it, I, I still can't make it stop. And I think that's really important. I also want to say that, you know, as, as a physician, you know, we're very against uh, people telling us what to do, right? But we also, we do know that as um, a profession, sometimes we're not so good at policing ourselves. And that's why in the state of California, if you want to take out uh, if you want to sterilize somebody who is not able to give consent, you have to go to court. And that is because there was an abuse of that, of that um, surgery. Most of the kids who are being sterilized, who are intersex, they are, they are not getting, they're not going to court to, to get the okay for this. So there's nobody really looking out for them. So the question is whether there's data about the proportion of children who get surgery versus the proportion who don't. Do you want that or you? Okay. Um, so there isn't really good data. We don't track all surgeries that happen in all hospitals in California or in the U or in um, the U.S. as a whole. Uh, what data does exist is actually really well cited in the HRW report um, in the back, but. Anecdotally, what we know from things like the research that HRW did is that um, doctors tell us that they're doing fewer surgeries, but they're not really able to tell us which surgeries they're no longer doing. Um, so it still seems like a very large proportion of children are getting surgeries. And when you ask doctors for the data on children who escaped or avoided surgery, they're not able to, pr to produce any. Um, because either either those children aren't out there or they haven't been doing follow-up studies on them. Yeah. Are there any um, like best practices out there that are going to work then after you or whatever else you react with or other countries that actually do this well and have more effective evaluating individuals? So the question is uh, what kind of best practices are out there? Um, there is a great guidebook called the DSD Guidebook that was written in California um, that you can get online at Interact site. Um, this is something though that's, that is still being done around the world. Um, this is still a common practice throughout the world. There's a few hospitals in Europe that have stopped doing it, um, but we really are at the beginning of a moment when, you know, when things are starting to change. Um, and when people are starting to consider different practices. The, the, but the guidelines for care that are out there by the medical associations um, and such generally recognize that surgery is harmful or can be harmful and that it can be delayed until the child can make, um, can make a choice. There's no real controversy about the fact that the surgery can be delayed. Um, I should add also that uh, for many of the supporters of this surgery, one of the things they'll talk about is that there's a silent majority out there that's happy, that it's only the few angry people that are complaining about this surgery. And it is certainly true that every intersex person who's spoken up about this procedure has asked for it to stop. And there are hundreds or thousands around the world who have. Um, so if there is a group of people that are happy, they are certainly silent because none of them have spoken. Um, but the real, or, or virtually none of them, but the you know, the reality is the medical community hasn't in 25 years been able to produce any evidence of, of these supposedly happy people who had surgery. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this for 25 years, and in that time, well, I've, I've been doing this since 1995, and in that time, I've met thousands and thousands of intersex people, and I have met two people out of those thousands of thousands of people that are okay with what happened to them. 
not, you know, extremely excited, but they feel like they, they kind of dodged a bullet and they're okay. But other than that, everyone else has been very deeply, deeply harmed. Uh, so the, repeat, it's a long repeat, question. Yeah, repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> summarize the question. Can I try? To, I'll try to summarize. Uh, so you pointed out that this would seem to violate bio, uh, bioethics. bioethics principles of autonomy and non-maleficence, and you're right that it does. And virtually every bi group of bioethicists that has looked at this issue has come to a similar conclusion that it's a huge problem, including uh, one of the major bioethicists who's written on this in the country, Katrina Carcasas, who's at Stanford. Um, so the the bioethics world has been um, by and large, very opposed to these procedures. Um, and, and so you further said that um, it seems sort of odd that this would persist, and you wondered about evidence of psychological harm from growing up with different genitals. Um, I'm going to pass it to Suji in just a second, but I'm just going to say briefly, um, not doing surgery is not equated to not assigning a gender. So regardless of what a child's genitals look like, you can assign that child a gender. A gender is a social assignment. You can assign that child a gender. Nobody needs to know what's in the child's diapers. Um, so for example, the child that you saw in the video was being raised as that family's daughter. And because they think that's her most likely gender identity, but they did not do an irreversible surgical procedure on her, she'll be able to make her own decisions as she grows. So uh, the intersex community doesn't advocate for not assigning a gender. They advocate for making a provisional gender assignment and leaving the child's body alone so they can make their own decisions as they grow. You want to? Yeah, yeah. And by doing that, you actually give that child the opportunity to make better decisions later in life because they have more tissue that they can do whatever they want with later. And, you know, you talked about uh, Dr. John Money, who started this whole concept back in the 50s, and he had this. Um, idea that there's a, a plastic age uh, for gender uh, up until two years, where if you did surgery then, that you could enforce a uh, normative gender identity. And uh, all of his studies actually had turned out to, to be false. The people, the, the particular patient in that study came forward, and there's a really amazing book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl. It's about that, that person. Um, but I also want to point out how... Um, we know that isn't how things work because people who are born with totally normative genders and are given social genders from the moment of their birth don't always take those genders. And other, if, this, if there was that plasticity till two years old, there would be, and, and that was true, there would be nobody who was transgender. So it makes absolutely no sense that that would be possible. Um, so yeah. Sorry, I think uh, part of the question too, but tell me if I'm wrong, was you know you have this group of theoretically you know well-intentioned pediatricians and urologists out there, you know, facing down this kind of body of evidence that these surgeries aren't working. You know, why why are they continuing to do so in the face of all evidence? And I, I think you use the word odd, and you're right. That is very odd. It's yeah. very odd. <laughs> in the medical community that we have 25 years of mounting evidence of harm and no evidence of benefit and very little change in practice. Um, and that is one of the reasons that this may be an instance in which it's important for the legislature to act. Yeah, yeah. and as I said before, I mean, we, we are not so good at policing ourselves in the medical community and sometimes it takes outside people to do that. 
And let me also add to that too. <laughs> Sorry, I have so much to say about that. Um, as a physician, when I tell my colleagues, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to go talk to, you know, about, to the legislature about this issue, and then talk to them about the issue if I haven't talked to them already, they are horrified to know that this is still happening. The majority of doctors think this stopped 20 years ago, but it's, a handful. it's, it's just a handful of surgeons that are still doing this and have completely decided this is the right thing to do decide, despite all evidence to the contrary. And so, um, you know, California's acted in situations like this before. For example, the ban on conversion therapy, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, there were, there were some outliers continuing to do these very harmful practices that have been heavily disproven, and ultimately it was decided that there was a need to limit those practitioners and their ability to do what they were doing because it was harming children. Um, to, to add to that a little bit because of the, the connection to conversion therapy, that's actually a really good analogy to the law that's already in place in California on that, um, which only covers people under the age of 18. Um, it, for anyone who's not aware of that, the, the ban on so-called conversion therapy, reparative therapy, ex-gay therapy, um, also known as sexual orientation change efforts, right? Like any, any way that you're describing that, the ban on that that exists in California only applies to patients who are under the age of 18 years old. Um, and part of the reasoning behind that is that, you know, being able to have somebody participate in the decision-making process of doing that, theoretically um, changes whether that should be permissible or not. There's there's a lot f more to discuss around that issue, which, which we can talk about um, in other contexts. Um, but the, certainly for anyone who's under the age of 18, um, having some sort of major decision like that being made, you know, without their input um, is a very good analogy to what's going on here, only it, this is in many ways even more serious because often the patient in question is so, so young, right? We're talking about infants and uh, that never comes up in the context of conversion therapy. So, you know, even more significant reason why uh, delay is so important. Um, and I'll just I'll just add one more thing because I know it is it's a little confusing to understand how so many of these procedures are happening when it's only a handful of doctors that are perpetrating them, um, and that's because these are rare conditions and they're handled by doctors who the surgeries are done by doctors who are really like a subspecialty of a subspecialty. It's a very small group of doctors that specialize in these procedures, and the doctors who are handing their patients off to them, the birth attendants and pediatricians. That's who, who Suji's talking about, uh, that, who are horrified and who thinks these practices stopped. They often don't know what happened you know, to that child that was born in their delivery room after they referred them to a, to a subspecialist. Um, so it's a very small community of subspecialists that are doing this that are pretty isolated from the mainstream of medical opinion, um, you know, where we're seeing things like the AMA statement and the Surgeon General statement saying this is a harmful practice. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that? Uh, Medi-Cal probably has that data, but last I heard we hadn't been able to get it out of them. Are you aware if we have any data? Okay. Um, so the question was, how many, do we have any data on how many are covered by Medi-Cal? It would be possible to figure that out. Um, my organization has done FOIA requests in other states in the past, um, and it ends up being a fairly cumbersome process to figure it out, but certainly not impossible. And if a legislator wanted to request that information, it would probably be possible. Um, but no, we don't have data right now. I have never, however, heard of a family who was not able to access this surgery because Medi-Cal wouldn't pay for it. We, we're certainly not having anyone turned away. And we do know that about a th in most states, it's about a third of the children. I'm not sure the data in California, but I'm sure it's a, a large percentage of children are covered under Medi-Cal, and Medi-Cal does cover these procedures. Any other questions at this point in time? Well, we'll be around for a few more minutes yeah. um, afterwards as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all so much.